Oh, and then you have to put into the level. This is a solvent. You might as well memorize that solvent. That seems to be a good solvent for that. And this one you end up with an anti. And then for the next part, it doesn't matter if we do H2O or H plus as long as we have like a. That depends on what your instructor wants. If your instructor okay. uses just H plus, sure. that's fine. H plus is just a shorthand for some acid. I think this is better, oh, but okay. H plus is just shorthand for an acid. Okay. Why don't we go through the mechanism for this then? What would be the mechanism here? Or I guess we didn't cover the mechanism for the first step, but what's the first step going to do? It's going to add a cyclic O. This gives us our oxacyclopropane. So far so good? Yes. And now we should show the mechanism for the second step. So we should show the complete mechanism for what happens in the second step here. Maybe you guys are having trouble with this next step. What, what should happen here in the second step? What should happen first when we add these reagents? Doesn't something steal an H from an, the H2SO4 and then some bond breaks? And Good. But let's take those step by step. How do we know? Now we know for sure what's going to happen first. We know for sure that the sulfuric acid has to give its proton to somebody. As we discussed, I think, yesterday, if you have a strong acid, you must start by having the acid give its proton to somebody. No exceptions. So since we have this strong acid, we must start by having the strong acid give its proton to somebody. Who is around that would be a good candidate to take that proton? Yeah, this oxygen here with its lone pair. So there's really no question about the first step. If we have a strong acid, we have to have it start by giving away its proton. Is, it, is that O positively charged? This oxygen here? Now, yeah, what is the charge, delta positive or delta negative? No, not oh, positive. after it takes the proton. No, no, I mean, without the proton, not delta. Is it actually positively or negatively charged, or is it just nothing? It's neutral. neutral. And the reason it would be neutral is that yeah. oxygens normally like to have two bonds, and this oxygen has two bonds. So it's in its normal state to be a neutral oxygen. I hope you're that you're comfortable now with these protonation reactions. Here's the basic mechanism for protonation. So let's draw what the intermediates would be after that step. Here's the first intermediate. Make sure that you all got the right charge on the oxygen now. Once the oxygen picks up a proton, it should have a positive charge. And the other product of this step was the sulfate. Now, it looks like some of you are comfortable with the next step, and some of you weren't sure what would happen next here. So the next step is that we should use our water from this step as a nucleophile. But who's the water going to attack? The beta. It's going to attack one of these two carbons. I guess we, I guess technically we call these both alpha carbons. It's going to attack one of these carbons. Now it looks like maybe one or two of you might have thought that this oxygen should attack this oxygen. And that seems very logical because this oxygen has a positive charge. However, I don't know if we had a chance to talk about this, but remember that positive charges only make something into an electrophile if they have an incomplete octet. I don't know if we had a chance to talk about this. Maybe not. A positive charge actually usually makes the thing you're attached to into an electrophile. It doesn't usually make the atom into an electrophile. So for a review, maybe we briefly talked about this before. Yeah, it was in your lunch, in your... In the handout, yeah. 
If something has an incomplete octet and a positive charge, then it's an electrophile. But if something has a positive charge and a full octet, it's a good leaving group. And the thing that it's attached to is the electrophile. So here's what the arrow should look like here. If something has a positive charge and a full octet, then it's the thing that it's attached to that is the electrophile. And the thing with the positive charge is the good leaving group. And we might have briefly mentioned the only thing you're going to see with a positive charge and an incomplete octet is carbocations. I think the only thing you're going to see in this course with a positive charge and an incomplete octet is a carbocation. So positive charges, except for carbocations, positive charges don't make things into electrophiles. They make them into good leaving groups. And they make the thing that they're attached to into an electrophile. I want to make sure you all have that handout. You guys all have the reactivity handout? I think that's actually an important idea. Anyway, on the reactivity handout, it shows these two cases. If you've got an X positive with an incomplete octet, it's a good electrophile. But if you have an X plus with a full octet, then the thing it's attached to is the electrophile. Well, this oxygen has a full octet, so it's not going to be the electrophile. It's the carbon that it's attached to that's going to be the electrophile. This oxygen will be a good leaving group. It's a kind of funny leaving group because it's not leaving all the way since it's still attached through behind, but it's going to leave this carbon over here that's getting attacked. Now we want to be careful about showing where the OHs are. Since I showed this water coming in from below, here's this water down below, and then this OH group over here is going to relax to the right, which would be the norm more normal bond angle for it. And the water, since it's coming in from below, is going to push this methyl group up. And if you wanted to, you could also show that it pushed the hidden hydrogen up. Whereas over here, the methyl group should still be pointing down below. And if you wanted to, you could show that hidden hydrogen is still below. This gives us a product. However, it was totally possible that the water could have attacked the right-hand carbon. So we also have to show what happens when the water attacks the right-hand carbon. water attacks the right-hand carbon, well, now the water on the right-hand side, oh, it looks like I skipped some steps here. Uh, these water, this water would still be positive. So if it attacks the right-hand carbon, the water would be below. And then the, car, uh, the oxygen would be pointing to the left on the top. This oxygen would relax out to the left. The water that came in from below would push the methyl group up. And this methyl group would still be down. And now we have to decide whether these are the same or different. Yeah, these are definitely two different pictures. These are definitely two different pictures, so we want to hold on to both of them. And then one more thing happens. The S, um, whatever, S -O -O -O. Now we should use the sulfate to take off these protons. Because H2SO4 always likes to end up H2SO4. That has definitely been the pattern in the reactions we've seen, yeah. These would give us these two final products. So there's a bunch of steps here. This is an important reaction. What type of reaction would this be overall? Well, first of all, we use the MCPBA to make the oxycyclopropane, and then we attack that with water. Overall, this is another dihydroxylation, right? You see why we would again call this a dihydroxylation? However, now it's anti and not sin. Precisely. Now it's anti and not sin. How did we know that this water was going to come in from the opposite side that this oxygen came in here? Because 
less hindered. Yeah, now we use steric hindrance. The water, this oxygen over here is blocking the top side, so it makes sense for the water to come in from below. Compare that to osmium tetroxide. In osmium tetroxide, the two oxygens attack at the same time from the same molecule, so it makes sense that it would come in from the same direction. But in this reaction, the two oxygens attack separately from different molecules, so it makes sense that the oxygen that comes in first will block one side, and then the second oxygen has to come in from the other side, which is anti. So this is a reaction where, well, we didn't go through the mechanism for the MCPVA, but we should definitely know the, the mechanism for this step over here. This is a very common attack on epoxides. If you protonate epoxides, that makes them into good electrophiles, and then you can have a nucleophile attack the carbon. So there's other examples. This is just one example of having a nucleophile attack a oxycyclopropane or epoxide. This gives us the anti-dihydroxylation, and as you guys were noticing, the osmium tetroxide gives us the SIP dihydroxylation. So those are two things that you need to have in your toolkit.